Oh, let's start this stream with a sneeze, baby. Oh, can you guys hear me? Am I live? Hello, hello, is there anybody out there? Just not if you can hear me. Hello. So, yeah, last time people were asking, when is the book out? I don't know. I said last time it'll be a few months. There's so much stuff that going on. I mean, you people don't understand. They're like, why do you do all this crap? Why are you trying to go on streams and debate people? Because that's how you get an audience. There's a book. There's a speaking, more than one speaking engagement. There is potential new TV show. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. So I wish that I had a date for the book. Yes, I have allergies. That's why I'm sneezing. The um, pollens are on are on full attack. Team pollen is attacking. And anyway, so I meant obviously to do this stream last week, and then uh, of course I got the strike, which means that you can't do streaming. And then uh, I had to get that removed. So that whole process, of course, was several days. And y you may think, oh, the worst you stream is, you think that's retarded, Evan. Well, I mean, that's where the people are. So if you want to grow your audience, you've got to do these kinds of things. You've got to have these kinds of engagements with, uh, you know, the JF worldview, the Richard Spencer worldview. And the reason that I was on the worst key scream a minute ago and I sent a pretty sizable chat was so that it would get through to sticks and so sticks said finally yes he's up for uh, some kind of discussion or debate so he finally agreed to it uh, as I've explained many times to people that's the kind of thing you have to do if you want to reach somebody because people with large audiences it's not easy to reach them um, I mean I have not that large of an audience. I mean, it's it's growing uh, on all that social media outlets. It's about 50,000 total, you know, between Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and the website. And that's that's good, but, uh, you know, and most of that's in the last couple of years. But, you know, when, you, when you're talking to somebody who's, get, who's got 100,000 followers, 200,000, 300,000, unless they know you, you know, it's very difficult to get through. So... You know, I'm, I'm constant, even with the lower amount, uh, I don't have enough time to get to all of these replies and responses and emails. So we'll be having an assistant very soon and, uh, hopefully that'll work out. And, um, but yes, so there is going to be a sticks debate. So that's good news. And you know, we're not going to be like harsh. It's not going to be, uh, I'm sure it'll be civil. It'll be sober. Uh, I've read a lot of the esoteric, neoplatonic, hermetic, Kabbalistic stuff. So I think it'll be interesting. And I feel confident that he's probably not interacted with anyone that actually has, you know, that level of uh, fluidity in these topics. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I always have to check before I start going into this stuff for a long time. No, I have not hired Aaron. <laughs> Man, what a bunch of drama. Good grief. You know what's funny is that I made that joke stream uh, like three nights ago. And I was doing impersonations. And I had no idea that I thought this was all drama and just clickbait, you know, get, get hits and get attention. Which is the norm. I mean, this is, you know, like it or not, that's human. That's the human domain, right? But that's why you do a debate is to grow your audience and to hopefully reach people. And I think, the, you know, the, the the JF debate reached a whole lot of people. But, you know, I was, I thought all this baked Alaska stuff was a joke. I was like, this is like, this is just internet drama to grow your audience and it started looking more and more real and more and more real and more and more serious. So that was just crazy. And anyway, I don't have time to follow that. I don't have time to 
to get enmeshed in all that. My my stream was just a joke, and then uh, you know I didn't have any connection to the events or to baked or any of the other people directly. It was just a joke stream. Um, and then man, all that stuff spiraled out of control. Nothing. I had nothing to do with any of that. Not connected to it. The last big internet drama I was in the middle of. Supposedly, I ended Worski Live, <laughs> which uh, they hemmed up, and I guess it was probably half real and half theatrics. I don't have anything to do with this one though. This is all baked versus everybody else in streaming, and it just went nuclear. So that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. And um, I'm a little too quiet. Can you hear me better now? Let me try to turn up the mic or something. Yeah, dude, relax, man. I'm not... You have to give an intro to what's going on and update people in the stream, Evan. <laughs> man, I'm tired of getting bitched at, dude, all the time. I can't... If I'm trying to stream and my channel gets strikes and I can't stream... You know, I'm trying to do my best, uh, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Genesis 4, 5, and 6 moving out of what we discussed last time. And I think this is going to be interesting because, uh, you know, I, I try to touch on the controversial Genesis 6 Nephilim question with as much objectivity and honesty as I can. So on the one hand, we have goofballs in the realm of evangelicalism and Steve Quayle. We've got Steve Quayle who tells you that the Nephilim are coming back and he goes on Alex Jones and he says, Alex, the Nephilim are here. I've met them in person. They come to my radio gigs. In fact, I've even interviewed five Nephilim in studio, All right? That was my Steve Quayle interview or impersonation. So we got people that are saying that that there's a Stargate that Nephilim are walking through. I think they've been watching too much Stargate, <laughs> which actually does have you know Nephilim and stuff in it. But um, so there's that extreme, and then there's the other extreme of the rationalist skeptic. Uh, oh, there's nothing like that that could ever happen. The world is always function on the principle of uniformitarianism. Everything that's everything that the way everything is now is how it's always been. Uh, we've seen in the previous talks that that is not true, even on the naturalist's own grounds. It's not true that because they will move the goalposts and affirm and reject uniformitarianism at different times. And so what happens when you study history, and one of my degrees is in history, is that you start to realize that they don't know as much as they think they know. Uh, there is a much larger place for skepticism, especially the further back you go. The further back you go, the less we know. Uh, and as you move up into recorded history and into, um, you know, particularly the period of Christianity and the Greek philosophers, you have more and more recorded history. You have more books, more works. Uh, so we know and can piece together more than we can than when we're trying to move back, uh, you know, thousands of years into the BC. So we just don't know. This is a key, key component here. And just because the establishment has invented an iPhone or invented, uh, a, you know, the personal computer, it doesn't mean that it's all the result of because they figured out uh, the Big Bang, or that they have some conception of millions of aeons of evolution. Those two things are not at all connected. In fact, the, the, I can prove that very simply by pointing out that many engineers have a theistic worldview, uh, and since the and if they're able to make progress, then making progress in some engineering, scientific, technical discipline does not require one's worldview to be either naturalistic or theistic. Now, I think it's more consistent if the person's worldview is theistic, uh, but certainly scientists who are naturalists and atheists make breakthroughs and discoveries, technicians, engineers, as much as theistic ones, right? So our overall paradigms are not proven 
when we make some breakthrough, right? I mean, if I was, uh, I'm sure there are Mormon engineers, right, who make significant advances in, I don't know, whatever Mormons are into uh, blonde hair dye or something and weird organic foods, maybe. I don't know. But whatever Mormons are into, uh, if a team of Mormon scientists made a breakthrough, it doesn't prove Mormonism, right? The Scientology magazine, probably, I, I've heard they have one of the best exposés of the people's cult, people's temple cult. Does that mean Scientology is true? No. Right. So we don't have, we don't prove a worldview by any singular, but specific, particular breakthrough, invention, advancement, theory, etc. The only way to prove paradigms, theories, and worldviews as a whole is to compare paradigms, worldviews, theories as a whole, and see which ones are consistent. So I say all that to preface the fact that when people say, oh, Genesis is ridiculous, we don't, that's all been debunked. Well, first of all, no, it hasn't. Secondly, why is it ridiculous? It's ridiculous, quote, because, number one, there's a lot of misunderstanding about Genesis, and people think that uh, it's all sort of fundamentalism and uh, you literally believe that everything in, in Genesis 1 is is that there's really walking, talking snakes and that there's not symbolic uh, manifestations of things and that the world in, in the Edenic state wasn't in a different ontological setting, which it was, you know, as Father Rose says in his magnum opus book on it. Um, so all of that's missing. And so they'll say, oh, uh, you know, I refuted uh, Kirk Cameron and whoever else, Ken Ham or somebody, in their overly simplistic, uh, you know, bad hermeneutics. So therefore, we know we know that that worldview is false. No, uh, just because people don't know about orthodox theology, they don't know about uh, different perspectives, doesn't mean that they've proven this whole religion false. So that has to be said first of all. And I know this because of being in the academic realm for so long. You know, 10, 11 years trying to work towards PhD. Um, and getting almost there and then deciding it was a waste of time. So what you realize is that most of these people are specialists and they really have no conception of, of things in other disciplines. Uh, and they have no conception of what they don't have a conception of. In other words, the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is rampant in academia. So when you go to your local university and you ask your professor about you know, the ancient world, all he's going to do is is kind of default to what he was told. He's going to default to, well, I when I went to college and I had my introductory geology classes or whatever, you know, we we know that the uh, the world is a you know a, millions of aeons and all this stuff. And then, but you say, well, what about Ernst Haeckel? What about Charles Lyell, the famous uh, uh, ge geologist, being shown to be false? What about the fact that most of these older theories? Uh, ontogeny from from Haeckel. These are these are all discarded now, but in fact, modern proponents of the naturalistic paradigm, they'll still just rely on these guys that have been debunked and and that their own people don't even adhere to anymore. And this is why Stephen Jay Gould came up with punctuated equilibrium, right? Because there wasn't any answer to that question. And so this new theory, right, in the 70s pops up from him. And he's just, well, the, the, the transmutation just happens really fast. And there's just not a lot of evidence yet of the, the fossil transitions. Anyway, all theory. And the dating methods are also laced with assumptions of the the proof being built into the method. And that's because of the uniformitarian issue. So whether it's radiometric, whether it's carbon, carbon dating doesn't really work for ancient ages because the decay rate for the situation in the situation where it's carbon dating is only like 5,400 years or so. They don't do that. They use radiometric dating. And the assumption is, well, we know that radiometric decay uh, has occurs because of this gigantic lifespan of millions of years so the dating is built into the assumptions of the decay rate dating it's circular 
and it really is that silly but it sounds very sophisticated you know to talk about oh metric dating um, and it sounds sophisticated to talk about measuring light from distant stars and the direction that this we don't know what direction stars are going in are they going away or are they going towards earth and if the universe exploded from where from what's from a central location so in other words unless you have a definitive uh, focused position in in space there's not any way to accurately measure what is moving in what direction away or towards a thing i mean, I mean in reference to the original big bang i'm saying so just because starlight appears to be moving away or towards or whatever that doesn't that doesn't dictate or prove the original location or locale fixation point which you would need to determine movement towards or away but that stuff is just assumed in these questions anyway so as we saw genesis is not not concerned with answering the specifics of how all of these things happened there it's concerned with answering the why right and so in a, in a sense galileo's dictum is kind of true i mean galileo is you know famous for pointing out that god wrote two books one revealed scripture and then one uh, the nature of, of science itself in natural revelation natural law uh and, and there's that's a sense of, there's a sense of which that's true okay okay but uh we of course don't accept it in the catholic thomistic sense and we also understand that yes genesis is primarily talking about theological truths that are also historical uh there's nothing intellectually embarrassing about saying that uh, it's only intellectually embarrassing when we have a paradigm where we think that we already know what is and isn't possible in unknown ancient history so in other words even if you were an unbeliever there's really no better status for the, let's say for the sake of argument right that the theory of planetary origins which the dominant theory, as I've pointed out many times, is the belly button lint theory, uh, which is just that space dust just started collecting and it just started spinning. And after millions of years, it developed some sort of gravitational attraction and more dust attracted. And eventually it became a sphere over millions. This is how stupid the dominant theory. So let's put that on the same footing as a book talking about the theological origins of mankind with a rough historical outline and that's it it's a rough historical outline we don't know every detail about all these people we don't know exactly we aren't told everything about other civilizations in terms of where uh seth uh, found his uh, his wives right so but presumably there were other children right that we just aren't told about uh in terms of adam and eve but the preeminent ones right Cain and Abel who were about to encounter they're mentioned in the narrative because of their theological importance and significance and that's that's as I pointed out in the critique of Father Stephen Freeman that does not mean that because there's a symbol or a type that it has no historical relevance or that it's a historical right there's no dichotomy or dialectical tension between a symbol and a historical instantiation or form or event and that's what we're going to be talking about today is that and typology so hopefully that kind of gives a basis as to why it's perfectly okay to be skeptical in fact i remember I had one of my professors my history professors in undergrad was a big fan of oliver stone and a really sharp guy kind of weird but we were talking one day and he I got, got him on this uh, theory of now he's a, a, a you know fairly well respected uh, academic guy I'm not going to name his name but uh, he laid out his whole reworking theory of Egyptian dynasties and how the dating of all the Egyptian dynasties was wrong now I'm not saying either way I don't really have any analysis or opinion of uh, the pharaonic dynasties and their dates uh, and it, this didn't have anything to do with the bible but i'm just making the point that here we are in this academic 
historical setting. And he's talking about how absurd he thinks the mainline narrative of dating Egyptian history is. Now, I'm not saying he's right or wrong, but if he was right, and he's just a mainline academic, this shows you that that this stuff is not as certain as you think that it is. Right? We assume that all of this stuff has just been sort of codified. And, oh, we know that now. We know that now. Right? But again, it really is the case that disciplines in the West are extremely compartmentalized. And until you've gone into academia and you've seen this and experienced it, it's hard to explain it or convey it or to give to convince people of this, especially in the, the this broader sort of skeptic community, you know, the YouTube skeptic community, the septic tank community. They think, and most of these people haven't been to the university, they haven't taken advanced classes in scientific theory, uh, you know, phenomenology and uh, cognitive theory. Um philosophy of science, right, all of which I have, they don't know what they're talking about. They're, they watch the videos online and they think that they've come to, you know, whatever kind of enlightenment they think they're at. And they look at Westboro Baptist Church and how that's fed Phelps, as I call him, that's some obvious fed operation. And they think that this sort of just is puts on display the absurdity of Christianity or something. Um, anyway, I mean, the skeptic community is, you know, it's being defeated. It's literally dying on uh, online, which is good. It needs to die, uh, and and it and it leads to total degeneracy, right? I mean, this is this is where it goes. It goes to Richard Dawkins saying, "It's time to eat people, right? It's time to it's time to eat people." And I just showed you in my Arthur Kessler talk. That's what Kessler says. Kessler says that eating people is the essence of the evolutionary worldview. So, we can do science. We can do all of this from either a theistic or a naturalistic paradigm. And in fact, I have argued for many years now, I think we would make many more scientific advances. And I, I even wonder if advanced science doesn't already, at a higher, maybe secret society level, reject naturalistic materialism. Many of the Cambridge Platonists do. Many of the Oxford Platonists do. Uh, many of them are involved in very hardcore, serious, high-level scientific projects. Uh, I'm just now reading The Pentagon's Brain by Annie Jacobson. She says the top scientists in the world are part of a secret society in the first chapter of her book. Now, I already knew that, but here's a mainline book saying that. So a lot of the things that I've talked about that I had... that I, was suspicious of. I had a suspicion this might be happening. Uh, it seems to continually be reaffirmed. And I guarantee you that the mainline narratives about human origins, plant, uh, planetary origins, uh, historical origins, that the mainline stuff they know is not true. Now, they, I don't think they know exactly what the answer is. But if you, if you understand psychological operations and if you understand the idea of a confidence game, if you've read Melville's novel, then you know a confidence game is the idea of uh, overplaying your hand, of, of, of overcompensating, if you will, the knowledge, infallibility, and certainty that you possess. So for example, if you're the US government, um, and that, this is just a, an example. You you might want to put forth the disinformation that you actually possess more advanced technology than you do, and you might do that just to to throw you know opponents off track to make them worried and, and thinking that you've that you've got something that they can't deal with, which you actually don't. And maybe you have it, maybe you don't, but you're putting out this sort of over overconfident uh, propaganda to throw them off. And that's one kind of tactic that, that can be done. And it can be effective if, if it's done correctly in terms of the, 
in terms of psychological warfare, right? It's no different than the than the military technique of you know making the enemy think that you've got uh, you know secret information on them that you don't actually have, or something like that. So, in the same way, the system that we live under uh, projects a high level of overconfidence that is really unjustified and that's why when you actually bring real logic real objective logic analysis and principles it all crumbles right? it, it does it cannot justify most of what it claims now if we go to google if we go to facebook and we see the way that they operate and their systems operate on just super infinitely complex mathematical principles and uh you know unbelievable advanced technology that has nothing to do with the engineers themselves and their worldviews right i mean there are plenty of engineers who are theists and if the naturalistic worldview was correct especially in its more dumbed down senses right there would be no theists who were scientists or engineers because I mean that for them that's like the number one mark of being retarded right you know, you believe in your sky god your you believe in your bearded fairy man in the clouds anyway so we are justified in being skeptical of the establishment's claims to know all about man's origins and what was going on 6000 7000 years ago now interestingly the normative datings of, of periods, you know, like when humanity was supposed to, to have arisen out of the ape stage of the Neolithic Neanderthal creature, character, monster stage, uh, it roughly lines up with, you know, 6,000 or 4,000 years BC. Oh, this is the beginning of recorded history, an emergent man with a, a mind and all this stuff and, and I and if, if you doubt me I'll read uh, Jacques Attali I was just uh, progressing further a couple days ago in the Jacques Attali book that we're going to do next for the Globalist book series and he had this long boring two or three chapters of giving the evolutionary worldview and its pronunciations about man's origins and it's funny. I wish I wish you could read this, just because of how dogmatic this guy is about what was going on eleven million years ago in the Sinai Peninsula, right, or in Mongolia. Dude, you don't know what was going on eleven million years ago in Mongolia. What a joke! Stop and think about that. How in the world are you going to test civilizational theory, you know, 8, 10, 1 million years ago? And he, I'm talking about he, where he's discussing, oh, around this region, uh, you know, after the out of Africa theory, we have primitive ape man developing tools, and then they figure out how to bash each other on the head, like the beginning of 2001. This is what Atali is talking about, right? And he goes through all the different places on like Pangea. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. There's no Pangea. Um, by the way, the, the continents don't float, right? So that's Pangea is not true because continents aren't floating. Uh, and part of the reason that Pan, Pan, Pangea is so uh, retarded is that it has this idea that, oh, look, this kind of fits here. So maybe, uh, you know, a zillion years ago, the earth crust was just, uh, you know, there was kind of a, separation and it just moved and moved and moved and it would it would have taken billions of years right for this this section of Pangaea to float away from this other section except but see they're not they don't float uh, and the movement rates don't work and by the way how do you accurately test uh, the movement rate of an entire continent I don't know about that that seems that seems suspicious to me just as much as the temperatures for nuclear explosions How, what device exactly measures a uh, hundred thousand degrees is there is there a device and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected here I'm just kind of being 
being a smart ass, I'm, I mean, is there actually a device that can withstand a hundred thousand degree temperatures? But that's what they claim, you know, the, the heat of the, the nuke explosions were. Uh, again, please correct me, but I'm, I just don't understand how you, and by the way, sometimes they get really specific with it. Like all this, the temperature was uh, 173,432 degrees. And I'm like, what, what doesn't melt? <laughs> like, you know, right away. Does anybody in the chat know how, how is this supposed, this is supposed to be measured a hundred thousand degrees? With an IR detector, how does an IR detector tell you that temperature? Because unless it's boots, yeah, I, I, I didn't say it had to be a thermometer. Did I say that? No, I, I understand that it's probably some kind of imaging uh, software or program. I'm just asking how is how is the color right? Because what else is it going to be analyzing? How is the color going to be able to tell you the temperature? A simple linear function. Okay, is the, you're saying is you know a simple linear function? This is how. Uh, a hundred thousand degrees is measured by the way what is the what is something that you have observed being measured at a hundred thousand degrees all right so anyway somebody he just googled something like how this is done yeah i'm not asking is there uh you know some kind of gps type software that that makes that assessment i'm asking how it's known that that assessment is accurate based on you know the, the light imaging or something like that yeah, I, I love these guys who, these people who think that they, they're scientific and objective. And then when something, a question like that's asked, they, they'll Google it and they, they spam it in the chat. Like, like they knew about this, like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. And oh my, my dad works at a nuke facility. Right. Again, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't think I should be expected to know this, but <laughs> if somebody does know. I'm fine with being corrected. I, I don't have any, it doesn't destroy my worldview if there is a way to measure 100,000 degrees. I'm just asking common sense. It seems a little strange to me that, right? I mean, it's it's a common sense question to ask, how did that little tin can fly 200,000 miles and then fly 200,000 miles back? I mean, have you? I've been in a Prius driving 5,000 miles in two weeks, right? That was crazy. That was a nightmare. Um, and I'm supposed to believe that a 1960s tin can flew 200,000 miles. I mean, come on. So these are, I think, valid questions. Now, we saw last time as we move on to Genesis that there was a strict contrast between the naturalistic worldview and the theistic worldview. And I gave you a bunch of pointers a bunch of areas where it's distinct uh, in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 of what the kind of God that we have presented and what we're told about in uh, naturalistic materialism, atheism, paganism, Gnosticism, right? We were, we were kind of contrasting our perspective with all of those and looking at the flaws and the problems. And we were looking at how a lot of those other positions lead to absurdity, right? Doing the presuppositional transcendental critique. Uh, and we were considering that, you know, what we're presented with in Genesis is unique. We're presented with revelation. We're not presented with speculation. This kind of, of text is very different from what you read about Zeus. Uh, if you've studied the classics, and, and I have at a graduate level, I'm very fluent in the, the Greek classics. And what you see is if you read the Iliad, for example, completely different from what's presented uh, in Genesis, um, not at all the same kind of God. So these sort of overly simplistic, naive zeitgeist style approaches of, uh, just because it talks about the transcendent, they're all the same. That's preposterous, right? And then this was, this came up in the Richard Spencer debate, right? Richard tweeted out that goofy article, 
uh, trying to argue that Easter is a pagan religion because of some 18th century Christmas cards that he found that looked like the pagan Teutonic goddess uh, Eostre or, or Astart or whatever. Come on, dude. It has nothing to do with that. Easter is Pascha, Passover, right? So, I mean, that was just really absurd. I'm not saying Richard wrote the article. It was some other person on that website. But that deserved to be refuted. It was so, it was so bad. Um, but we see that, that this, this kind of deity that we're talking about here is revolutionary, not just to people nowadays, but especially in the ancient world. I mean, it was very revolutionary in the ancient world to think that the, these people, right, the, the tradition given to Moses, this, this Hebrew revelation here that it claimed to have the one true God, right? The other religions didn't claim that. It, it was assumed that your God is just a tribal God. And this is, by the way, this is what goofy atheists today still say this. Your, your tribal God, your tribal savage deity of the Hebrew Israeli psychopaths, your, your tribal deity was a savage of course, when you actually start asking them on what basis they think something is savage or immoral, they have no idea because they're moralist, uh, more they're they're nihilistic, amoral relativists. Um, but what begins after the fall, and this is interesting because when we're told at the end of Genesis three that when they fall, they're banished from paradise. They did not pass the test. So what this did, as we said, was brought what Orthodox theology considers to be ancestral sin. This is different from um, the Western conception of original sin, where man is believed to inherit the guilt uh, of Adam, uh, whereas we believe that he inherited the consequences, the effects of Adam's sin, but not necessarily the inherent, the inherent guilt that Adam incurred. And this is because God does not, as he says many times in Scripture, uh, fault a person for what another person did however the way our world is set up metaphysically and physically you can affect other people with your actions right and that's thus the basis for someone being at no fault so if i murder a person i have the ability to affect other people with my actions however they are not necessarily at fault and in a way adam broke all of the ten commandments you see, so the whole moral law is the whole covenantal moral law that is basic to fundamental to mankind, to nature. Adam broke all of those, yes, and even the Sabbath, when he should have rested in God, spiritually, in faith, theologically, and not tried to listen to the serpent. He should have overcome that. He didn't. Eve failed too. Thus, both were cursed. And then we have all the effects of the fall. And the effects of the fall are both physical and spiritual. So a bodily death as well as spiritual death. Spiritual death thus being the loss of divine life. Although man did not lose all of his faculties, he did not lose all of his qualities, his will, or anything like that. He retains his natural abilities, uh, but he did lose the divine life, divine communion. And thus became subject to death and corruption and slavery to his passions. Right. So this is the conception of the fall that we have. This is different from the Augustinian, Latin, Catholic, Roman Catholic, Western conception, especially in things like Lutheranism and Calvinism. In those, in those schemes, man's sins uh, more or less bind him to, in Lutheranism and Calvinism, producing mainly sin. Essentially, every action of man is, is sin in some way, tainted. Uh, God is viewed as this sort of austere judge who uh, has damned the mass damnata in the Latin, all of mankind because of what Adam did. Uh, Eastern theology is very different. Uh, Eastern theology has, as we said, from the beginning, the conception that Christ came to overcome what Adam did and thus to restore the totality of man's fallen nature. This is why, pay attention here, I know we're off topic of Genesis, but it's, it's going to be relevant because we have to understand two distinct falls, two distinct, distinct anthropologies here. This is why 
in Western theology, uh, all, as I mentioned, I think in the last talk on this, what, man's faculties are all smashed into his nature. And that's because everybody is viewed as damned. Uh, and this is why Rome didn't interject a, a worked out theology of limbo, the limbus patrum, the limbo of infants, until uh, the early Middle Ages. Now, there were questions of purging after death. There were questions of uh, a kind of um, forgiveness of sins after death. Certainly, the church fathers all teach that. That's pretty unanimous. The question is, however, is this a, a punishment of fire and purgatory? And this is where the East and the West differ. The West believes that it is an actual... <laughs> physical spiritual flame of punishment for temporal sin uh, temp temporal debts and, and payment of sin uh, this is what purgatory is however if you've committed a mortal sin and you didn't confess that or have it forgiven or absolved you will not enter into even purgatory so anyway it becomes a preposterous god in the western latin scheme is the most extreme talmudic uh, bean counter and this is why it is absolutely correct to point out that uh, Alphonsus Liguori and his absurdities of casustry and justifying lying right as the sort of apex of Roman Catholic Talmudic casustry there's no better example of this this guy focuses on hell like perpetually the whole like he's got giant books of nothing but how he will be tortured in hell. And how different is that from the entirety of Orthodox theology, life and experience and liturgy, night and day. That's why you can't join with Roman Catholicism is that there's no way that the experience of someone like Alfonso Liguori is the same as the experience of somebody like St. Gregory Nyssa. I mean, these, these guys are night and day. Uh, but we know who the fathers of the first thousand years are, as even the West admits, in the ecumenical councils and the ecumenical councils affirm the fathers the preeminent fathers of the east and the west are the fathers of the eastern ecumenical councils and the west admitted that for a thousand years and then when the frankish carolinians take over the entire latin church goes off into insanity and naturally that's why we have the rise of the papal states, papal decretals, papal insanity, and all of the garbage of the Middle Ages. And this is why there's so many atheists, more nihilists, and people who are on a rampage to destroy what they think is their enemy. And really, this this Latin giant Latin bureaucracy uh, isn't their enemy. It's actually their their greatest friend because it creates more atheists than anything Richard Dawkins could imagine. And that's because of a bad theology and anthropology. And this is what nobody can get. Right? This is where nobody goes to this, to this issue. And we have that bad anthropology in the West because of Platonism, because of Originism, because of Origins Doctrine of Simplicity being adopted directly from uh, the Platonists, and then directly by Augustine. And that doctrine of simplicity then passing on into uh, later Latin theology explicitly, and primarily with Anselm and Aquinas. And this is why you get the satisfaction theory of the atonement with Anselm, this whole idea that God has to pay himself an infinite debt, and that this is a real being counter Talmudic transaction. No, or Orthodox theology never has any of that. I mean, why there was nothing like any of that in the first thousand years of the church, and everybody knows this. And how does Rome justify all this? Oh, it was developed. It just developed, right? Anyway, we're not here to talk about Rome and all that madness, but we are here to talk about ancestral sin, which is the beginning here in Genesis of man's fall. And it, you have to talk about the distinction between our view and their view. This is why ecumenism is not going to work. There's no way to reconcile two completely different theologies, anthropologies, eschatologies, metaphysic, etc., etc. This is why Rome teaches evolution, right? Humani generis. You know, the pious, 
Pius the Twelfth uh, uh, in his encyclical says, uh, yes, you can believe in theistic evolution. Theistic evolution is preposterous. Uh, I mean, first of all, it, I mean, there's death for millions of years before death came, according to Paul, at the fall. Right? So then they come up with this Gnostic explanation of, oh, well, there's natural death, but uh, Adam brought spiritual death. Uh, no, in all of Paul's epistles, Paul says Adam brought physical and spiritual death. Right, So this is where it leads uh, but that's how they don't, you're not talking about people interested in being consistent. They're, they're involved in dissimulation. So the fall of mankind results in man being banished from the presence of God. And as Father Rose points out in his magnum opus, great Orthodox 20th century defense of creation in Genesis, man, uh, which is titled creation, Genesis creation, early man, which I have sitting here next to me. We will do that eventually. <clears throat> <clears throat> Here we contrast, right? The greatest uh, uh, ascetic of North America, probably the next saint, uh, Father Rose. What does orthodoxy hold up in the 20th century? St. John Kronstadt, right? Father Rose, probably St. Rose. Oh, and what does Rome give us? Ecumenism and theistic evolution and participation in pagan rites. So you can go, I mean, I'm just saying, yeah, there's a lot of problems in orthodoxy, but I'm just saying Father Rose's book is normative and it's a solid right, reputation of evolution and the theistic evolution. And this is, this is common in orthodoxy, should be. I'm hoping to make it more and more common. Uh, when you go to Rome, what's common? Total evolution. That's what's common. You are in a small minority in the world of Rome if you don't adhere to uh, evolution or theistic evolution. So, I'm just saying from a theological standpoint, that speaks volumes. So man is banished and the cherubim, interestingly, who seems to be in charge of this gateway, uh, this sort of dimensional access the cherubim banish adam out of out of eden right east east of eden and that's this by the way is why we pray towards the east in orthodoxy is that we await the return to eden and now the church is the down payment the kingdom right already uh in time and space spiritually speaking eden uh, and eventually the whole universe will be remade to be eaten as it was intended to be but that's what we await and we talked about the proto-evangelium last time the gospel being preached in genesis 3 right? the seed of the serpent the seed of the woman the seed of the woman being of course christ he is the fulfillment already in genesis 3 15 the gospel is being preached adam himself is a type of christ according to paul in romans and corinthians so typology enters into Genesis right away, and the gospel is being preached in Genesis right away. This is what's so crucial. This is why this stuff is historical. If Adam is not historical, then the incarnation of Christ in the flesh is not historical. Jesus is just as historical as Adam. Jesus says he's just as historical as Adam. So all these heretics that want to get rid of that notion and say, well, Jesus was wrong. Yeah, you've abandoned the Christianity. Good job. And all because you wanted to placate people like Richard Dawkins who already hate you to begin with. You can't placate the people that hate you. This is retarded. So, man falls. He's banished. Um, Eden, it appears, was on a kind of mountain. I mean, we don't exactly know where this, where this was in a different plane of existence since the, it's, it appears the cherubim who do uh, in Scripture in Ezekiel and so forth are spoken of as having the governance of the natural realm underneath God uh, and they do seem to relate to uh, the issues of time and space and this is interesting because even in a lot of pagan philosophy and theology Egyptian thought the Sphinx right, is more or less kind of similar to a cherubim and what does this, the Sphinx do? He uh, keeps man out of certain areas of course you know the riddle of the sphinx type mythology um, but he's kind of in charge of uh, entrance to other 
planes, other worlds, other layers, other places, right? He's a guardian. And we do have in our theology the notion of the celestial hierarchy and these uh, sp- these ranks of spiritual beings, celestial intelligences governing the, the, the universe uh, with and under God. Right? So God is direct in his actions, but he's also direct in his actions through uh, his creations, and that's man and angels. So angelology is very important to being biblical. It's, it's crucial to uh, orthodox theology. It's everywhere in the liturgy, and right away, it's, it's the angels, right? The cherubim, which is sort of the highest up there with the seraphim rank, uh, that are banishing man from the garden. And so man enters into a kind of desolate wilderness. So we have the exodus. That this What sin does is it brings wilderness. This is a motif, a pattern that you will see throughout Scripture. Sin is what leads to the wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, and Adam and Eve's banishment is a kind of banishment to the wilderness. Now, if you recall, God said, the earth will be against you you will toil by the sweat of your brow thorns and thistles it's going to bring forth weeds this indicates the alteration in the ontological status of the natural world there weren't weeds and problems earlier those plants would have had some other way of being that was more conducive to harmonious living now the natural world is screwed up now it's not totally ruined but things are out of whack and we have that explained early on in genesis and that's because of man being a bad steward. Christ, as we said, comes back to restore this dominion mandate. If you recall, the dominion mandate was go forth, be fruitful, multiply. So Adam was intended to be a kind of prophet, priest, and king underneath God. He failed in that role. And he ruined it for his descendants, his lineage, his genetic copies to come were tainted and messed up because of that. Now, we have to also recognize that Genesis doesn't explain to us, other than in, in sort of brief allusions and then later in other texts of Scripture, that there was a corresponding war in heaven. The Apocalypse tells us that one-third of the angels fell with Satan. This fall was over man himself, and the status and role that man would have, and the fact that most likely, as many of the fathers teach, because the Logos had intended to become incarnate from the very beginning, this enraged Lucifer. And since Lucifer and the angelic nature was not going to be supreme, Lucifer decided he was done with both God and man. So the envy of the devil is what instigated Lucifer to oppose God and man. So, and this is why Jesus calls Satan a, a thief. He was a liar and a thief from the beginning. He stole man's life. So Jesus is, of course, the rectifying figure here. Jesus restores and recapitulates what Adam did in his failure. And we have to understand the reality of the angelic war. Right? There was some kind of war in heaven, as the apocalypse describes, uh, this is perhaps why the universe bears the catastrophism that it bears. We don't know exactly. I mean, I think there's some something true to the idea that the ancient myths tell us about the wars of the gods. I'm not saying that all the goofballs out there in the evangelical world that go crazy with this are right. I'm just saying I think there's something to this. I don't. I can't tell you exactly how or what what it all is we don't know we, and you know if, if we really needed to know all those details god would have told us uh maybe somebody knows if anybody out there knows i mean the, the church fathers do speak of, of this quite a bit many saints many theologians and in fact if you have the deuterocanon the full orthodox deuterocanon there's a lot more hints and details that you don't get even in the catholic bible and we're going to look at a couple of those tonight that will probably be in section two for subscribers when we get to Genesis 6 uh, and the question of the Nephilim. And I am on the side of Nephilim being Nephilim. 
Yes, I do not believe that Genesis 6 is talking about just the sons of Seth. It's talking about angels. And the fact that it's, it's so obvious that it's talking about angels. The only reason people don't want to do that and go there is because they, for one, yeah, there's a lot of idiot evangelicals that go crazy with it. Um, but the majority view of the church fathers was that it was angels. The uh, older rabbinical teaching of that time of the, of the first few centuries of the church and prior was that it was angels. The new text in the new Testament back up that it was angels. The Deuterocanon explicitly says it was angels. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any question about this really. If we just simply believe what the text says, right? And we do have examples of gigantism as a fact of archeology, span even as a fact of human physiognomy today. So this is not inconceivable. How exactly all this went down, we're not told. We don't know. We don't know what life was like exactly, even in the post-Lapsarian, that means post-fall days, the days of Noah. Even then, it was still kind of different because people lived longer. Right? We're told that Methuselah, you know, lived 900 and whatever years. Uh, you know, Noah lives to a very ripe age. Uh, and it's only later on that God sort of scales down man's lifetime to uh, as actually a, a, an act of mercy to limit what he could mess up, uh, as we'll see. But I'll, I mean, this is an, another thing people don't know either, is that, that uh, eating meat doesn't even come until Noah. The death penalty and eating meat don't come until Noah. And again, when we read Jacques Attali, uh, all I can say is that if you read his chapters on the origins of mankind, you know, from Caveman, from Captain Caveman, it's preposterous. I mean, it's, it's so dumb. It's not even, and I mean, here's the top globalist, right? Top thinker, public intellectual, top, you know, he's probably above Dawkins, you know, in the the, the powerful global influencer sphere. I mean, I, I know Dawkins is kind of a pop figure, but he does have a, you know, an, a, a level of influence. And, you know, Atali is probably a, a, an intellectual above him in terms of power, globalist power, so to speak. And there, he, there's nothing. There's no footnotes. There's no proofs. There's no citations. And what, what are you going to cite anyway to prove, you know, Tilt down, man. <laughs> what are you going to cite to prove this stuff? It's just declared. It's just definitively declared. We know, you know, man's origins out of Africa, Siberian Peninsula, blah, 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 blah. Um, and when you compare that to what we see in Genesis, you know, looking at both of these accounts for many, many years, I, I mean, Genesis makes a lot more sense to me. It does. And you say, well, you're getting into crazy stuff with with uh, giants. Well, now, wait a minute. Why is that crazy? Right? You've already determined what's possible and what's crazy from the outset. A hundred years ago, nobody would have thought that Tesla technology would be able to transmit movies through the air, through the ether. Wireless transmission of millions of gigabytes of information every day terabytes every day who would have thought that you would have, oh you're a nutball it's not possible and why is that because of a stunted stupid conception of what is and is not possible that's why it really is that simple now that doesn't mean everything's possible right that doesn't mean we go into crazy land but the world is a crazy place right i mean do we actually know we don't know what's going on at cern I mean, there's a million conspiracy videos. Uh, I tend to think that it's probably something to do with some kind of control mechanism or weapon spying type technology. It could be, you know, the whole Hadron thing could be a front. Who knows? Uh, but we don't know, right? So the fact that we don't even know what they're up to and they're doing this kind of crazy stuff, they, they're doing something. What it is, we don't know. Uh, just shows how much we don't know. Maybe they don't know. <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they don't have any idea what they're doing. But the point is that, that this account is not irrational. This account is not impossible. It's far more coherent than uh, many other ancient texts. If you read 
the Iliad, the Odyssey. If you read the Gilgamesh epic, which it's often compared to, there's really stupid stuff in the Gilgamesh epic. I mean, it's really preposterous stuff. Um, what we see in Genesis, I don't think is preposterous because it's a theological explanation of ancient man of ancient origins, and it really isn't making any outrageous statements, right? I mean, unless you just from the outset don't believe that it's possible that there's a creator, you know, what what else here is that outrageous? That that man causes trouble for him? Well, obviously, man causes trouble for himself, right? Man evidences that he's a fallen being every day. We all do. I do. You do. We all do. So, so the idea of a fall is associated with the idea of moral objectivity. So from the outset, man was accountable to a moral standard uh, and he chose to go against that. And he is thus liable and culpable. Uh, and God has even made recourse to resolve that. Now, with that worldview uh, of man's origins and anthropology, we have an idea of why there's right and wrong. Now, I'm not saying that itself proves that that's why there's right and wrong, but I'm saying it gives an account for why. Uh, the other worldviews do not. There is no right and wrong. That's why Jacques Attali, that's why Arthur Kessler, Dawkins, they, they all say, well, there's nothing actually wrong with cannibalism cannibalism is simply part of our evolutionary process there's nothing wrong with eat, eating people in fact uh, you might just revert to your reptilian uh, pineal state at times and choose to eat people or rape or murder nothing inherently wrong with it it's just an older evolutionary program coming to the fore right. nothing wrong with invading a tribe genociding them taking their their <clears throat> taking the, their children and offering them to Molech or something, right? Nothing inherently wrong with that. Just how things went down. Just the way of the world. And it may sound cool on YouTube and message boards to, to talk that way and affirm that and act like you're a hard-nosed Darwinist materialist. But nobody actually lives that way, do they? No. Especially not the internet atheists who are the most moral crusading uh, virtue signalers that you can imagine, right? So they're, they're all on quest to prove the Christians to be hypocrites, the theists to be hypocrites. You're all hypocrites. Look at the hypocrisy. I had two of them this week coming at me trying to prove hypocrisy. And I simply say, if God doesn't exist, there's no such thing as hypocrisy. There, there's no moral standard of that you have to hold, adhere to some kind of hypocrisy being wrong well, no you don't <laughs> yeah you may not like it but so what who cares who cares if you don't like hypocrisy why is hypocrisy wrong so the very action that they take in trying to go after people for quote being hypocrites for god being a savage god being immoral god being a monster is ref it, it refutes their own moral nonsense position and when you question them about it they can't give anything they don't have anything they'll say well, just freaking common decency, man. Freaking common decency, man. Like, it's just basic human ethics not to do that, man. And anybody with a modicum of philosophical sense and depth is chuckling right away. Chuckling and biting their nails to leap on the stupidity of that kind of response because that is philosophical nonsense common the what is common decency i mean it's becoming common decency not to uh say the word tranny i'm on, I'm on my seventh month of ban on facebook for the t word which mark zuckerberg has apparently just now decided uh, is a bad word is that common decency? Common decency is the most ambiguous, nonsense, empty statement ever. It means it's nothing at all. <laughs> common decency. But this is what you get with these kinds of people. This is just total retardation. Um, so let's look at Genesis 4. And I, I'm going to have to get a cup of coffee and a, and a little bit of water here. 
my throat's getting a little bit dry. So when man is banished and he's given skins, coat of skins, this is interesting because uh, most Orthodox theologians tend to think that that whatever kind of state, I mean, we're not saying that it was against matter. Matt, there's nothing inherently evil about matter, but however matter and spirit operated before the fall, it was in some sense more unified. It was in a different way of being than it is now, where it seems to kind of be split in some way. Um, and that's why, you know, when we die, our, our spirit leaves our body. Uh, when man fell, it says that he was given a, uh, God clothed him with a coat of skin. And so man has now adopted this kind of animalistic aspect to his being. Again, doesn't mean that before the fall he was like a Gnostic floating ghost or that he was anti-material. No, we don't necessarily say that. We simply say that that whatever kind of being, or, or excuse me, state of being or ontological status man's nature had before the fall, it's going to be, it was like it will be in the restoration. And when we see the resurrection of Christ, we see what Adam's pre-fall state was like. And so in the resurrection, Christ's humanity is still physical, right? Thomas puts his fingers in the side where he was pierced. It's still the same body, still the same Hebrew body. He didn't change genders or lose his ethnicity uh, to some of you Gnostics out there. Uh, no, he's still the same Jesus, uh, but his, his body takes on a different... Uh, status in terms of what it's capable of doing. Right? He appears out of nowhere. He's able to eat still. Uh, he, uh, you know, transcends space and time. And as John says in his epistle, when we see him, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he truly is. So our bodies will be conformed to his glorious body, as Paul says, and it will be made spiritual. Right. So and a lot of Gnostics mis mistake this to mean Oh, uh, in the resurrection, your body is not physical anymore. It's, quote, spiritual. No, there's no dichotomy between spirit and physical. Right? That's a, a Gnostic assumption, and we do not teach that. That is absolutely rejected as heresy in orthodoxy. It's not physicality. It's the mode of being. It's the, it's the way our physicality exists in reality that changes. Right? So spirit and matter... Spirit will be unified and will raise matter in some new way to a new way of being that we do not conceive, but that will be like Christ's resurrected body. So this is very important because this refutes a whole host of heresies. In fact, Roman Catholicism even, they don't even, this is almost like forgotten in their, their theology of the resurrection. Right? I mean, when you ask Roman Catholics about heaven and all this, they talk about the beatific vision. Oh, you, you, you go to heaven and you stare into the essence of God and you're satiated. Your intellect is satiated because you see uh, the essence of God. I mean, come on. That's not what the Bible talks about the final state being. It's the resurrection, the resurrection into bodies. You're going to be resurrected in the same body you have now. And by the way, this disproves Calvinism and Augustinianism. Uh, why are all people resurrected? If Jesus only died to save the elect, so-called. Now, we believe, of course, that ultimately it is only efficacious in the fullest uh, theosis sense for those who were foreknown. Uh, I'm asking a different question, question about the restoration of man's nature. Why are all men resurrected? Jesus says all men are res res resurrected, right, in John. So we know they are. Paul says all are resurrected to the same degree that Adam brought all to fall and death. And that's because Christ assumed universal human nature. This is an aspect and a part of the doctrine of recapitulation that is fundamental to Orthodox theology and nowhere in Latin and Protestant theology. This is a fundamental distinction and difference. This is another reason why you can't blend these two churches. They can only be blended. They can only be reunified when the West rejects its stupid Nestorian doctrine of the resurrection where Jesus only resurrects the elect. No, Jesus resurrects all men because all of human nature is restored in the resurrection. That doesn't mean that all men are saved. It means that all men's nature is restored, and that's the basis. That's the only possible basis 
for why all men are resurrected. There's no other basis for being resurrected. By the way, this right here, this if you understand what I'm talking about, this ends. This puts an end to Catholic theology for you. Like you can't be Catholic anymore. Because they don't even talk about this. And this is fundamental to Orthodox theology and all the Orthodox fathers. All right, Christ assuming universal human nature and raising all men thereby. Now, granted, yes, the Roman Catholic Church was like, yeah, well, all men are going, there will be a resurrection. I'm not saying they don't teach a resurrection. I know that. Uh, but what they teach is that the resurrection is specifically efficacious for the salvation of the predestined in the Augustinian sense, in the Thomistic sense, uh, and that therefore Jesus died to save the elect. Now, the problem is that this stress that they put on that eventually meant that the grace of God is limited to the institutional church and baptism. So you get that very strong Roman Catholic no salvation outside the church doctrine because of the August, <coughs> Augustinian acceptance of baptism as the only means by which you can be connected to Christ. Right, So there's no longer a uh, fundamental aspect to humans, human nature itself, which already links a man to Christ, which is what we would say, which is why Paul says, uh, which is why Paul says uh, the word is near you even in your heart to Greeks who haven't been baptized, right? Pagans. Jesus, as John 1 says, who lights every man who comes into the world. How is that? That's not possible on this theology. On this theology, you have only a natural state uh, of being until you are baptized, right? And this is why uh, Augustine had to eventually admit unbaptized infants are damned. Now, no Orthodox theologian, no, no Orthodoxy has never taught that. We don't teach that. And this is a, one of the easiest ways to see these two theologies are distinct. Now, the later medieval Rome, and this was held in the West up until the eight or nine hundreds, and then it starts to be softened with the introduction of the Limbus Patrum. Well, we're not going to throw the unbaptized infants all the way into, you know, the lake of fire. We're going to put them kind of up towards the, uh, the, the balcony of the lake of fire where it's kind of hot up there, but, you know, maybe sweaty little babies, but they're not, you know, literally cooking. We're not going to cook the babies. We're just going to make them sweat. Oh, so this is just ridiculous. I mean, no wonder people would be like, what? I mean, this makes no sense, right? So this is also why they don't understand the descent of Christ. And as the New Testament very clearly says, Jesus Christ preached the gospel to the dead in Hades, which shows us a revolution again in theology between East and West. God is solicitous for man's salvation. He's not eager as a Talmudic bean counter to toss infants into a lake of fire. And no wonder people adopted atheism given these this ridiculous Augustinian theology. And you're talking to you're I'm ta I'm a dude who was like mega Augustinian, okay? My twenties was dominated by reading most of this dude's works. I'm talking thousands and thousands of pages. I took his name when I became Roman Catholic. So it was very, very difficult for me to eventually admit serious criticism of my hero. But I had to be honest and do it. And I had to be honest and do it because I delved even deeper into the Eastern Fathers. And I started realizing these guys have a really serious correction for the extremities in Augustine's theology. And let's be, let's be honest here. We all know. Augustine's theology absolutely gave rise to Luther and Calvin. Of course it did. Everybody knows that. And Jansenism. Yeah, duh. <laughs> we all know that. Right, so we, that's not, we can't soften that aspect of man's soteriology and anthropology, right? Uh, now, I'm not saying Augustine was a Calvinist. No, no, no. I mean, they, they took him to like another extreme. But all of the, the clay is already present within Augustine to mold it into Lutheranism and Calvinism. But again, we see that the only basis for all men being resurrected is not some random fiat, not some random thought of God, but an actual metaphysical connection to the fact that Jesus assumed human nature. And what that did was it rent renovated 
all of human nature. Now, to explain specifically how it is that that isn't universalism, we go into the questions of uh, how uh, the mode of man's willing is what determines his experience of the afterlife. Now, this is a little complicated, uh, but I would say you got to read eventually uh, St. Maximus the Confessor, who goes into this very in depth. Uh, more recent theologians, uh, I think uh, Harothios Vlachos has written on this, the afterlife for man. And uh, it, it, for for a wide audience, the easiest way to ex to explain this is the C.S. Lewis book, uh, The Great Divorce. And this is kind of a parody of uh, The Great Marriage. Uh, I forget who wrote Great Marriage, but somebody who was trying to like argue the some kind of weird form of universalism and C.S. Lewis's point even though he wasn't orthodox he was essentially making the orthodox point on this which is that look you can't force people's wills into liking something right this is a fundamental aspect to free will and we do retain free will after the resurrection that's another thing that people don't realize they don't think about that and so since that's the case uh, in the resurrection all men's natures will be restored, but what they do with that nature through the mode of their willing, right? To prefer vice or to prefer virtue, to prefer evil or to, to prefer the good, that will determine their experience of the afterlife. So for example, for us, there is damnation. There is you having a very real choice to reject God. Um, but the experience of the afterlife is not a giant pit of literal lava okay that is opening up in some cavern somewhere uh it, it's not it's not about location okay so and i'm not saying there's no hell or that right i, I mean if you're talking about where is hell it's every if you are a if you hate god it's everywhere right in other words hell already begins for you in this life the miserable atheists the miserable satanists and so forth now they're not all miserable but they eventually will be many of them are i'm just saying that for many people hell begins in this life just as much as deification and and theosis begins in this life and so when you die you just simply go on into continuing to experience that uh in the spiritual sense and so in the resurrection if you've chosen uh death over life as god says in the law i set before you life and death choose which one you will serve this day uh those that choose death and life guess what that river of fire right the 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 river of fire is the water of life the same energies that radiate and emanate from the divine glory that the righteous love and seek after in this life and the next it's that same divine energy and power that torments those that hate him so it's not that god runs away right you can't go from god you can't go away from god and that's what the the wicked will be forced to uh, experience it's not that you go somewhere you don't run away to the lake of fire which is like 500 miles down underneath vesuvius or something no, right? It's not Dante's Inferno. There's not a Limbus Patrum. It's not like that. Uh, and when you understand the Orthodox doctrine of Hades and the descent of Christ into Hades to preach the gospel, by the way, which why would he do that if God was the Talmudic bean counter ready to damn and cook the babies? doesn't make any sense. It's stupid. It's not only stupid, it's blasphemous. That's not the kind of God that we worship. I mean, if, the, if God is that way, he wouldn't have become incarnate and died if he's this malicious Talmudic bean counter. That's crazy. Crazy talk. He's not paying himself an infinite debt, Anselm. <laughs> That's crazy. No. Uh, he, from the very beginning, intended on raising man, deifying man. Man rebelled, and he even still forgave man. Sorry? That's the kind of God we're talking about. Does that kind of God want to damn non-elect infants because they didn't make it to a baptismal font in time that's crazy no only a rigorous legalist who hasn't experienced divine love 
would see God that way, right? The people that have that kind of hatred and anger in their hearts think that God is that way. And they're projecting what they believe God is and how they see the world onto God. But when you actually learn and believe Orthodox biblical theology, you see that God is love, right? It's not that God is intent on damning everyone. It's that God allows man to freely move towards him or away from him. And for all eternity, you can move towards him or away from him. Uh, and, and that's not saying that everybody's saved either, by the way. Uh, but but there is a mystery to this aspect in the sense that men do retain their the operation of their wills even in the afterlife. And so we aren't told exactly how that's going to go down. And that's a good thing. I'm glad uh, Jesus didn't set us up as the final arbiters. Uh, I don't want other dudes judging me on, on my in my life. I, I want a benevolent God who knows everything to, ju to judge uh, this situation. Uh, let me rest in the hands of God and not in the hands of men. Men are tyrannical. So this is what we want, actually. We want this kind of a situation and setup and theology. So this view of eschatology is immediately connected to the Genesis narrative in our theology. Right? You, you immediately are presented with uh, things that might on the surface seem a little strange, but when we understand Orthodox theology, I think they tend to make more sense. And again, I spent many years in Protestantism, many years in Catholicism, and then many years uh, delving into the Orthodox tradition, and this makes much more sense, I think. So, so a lot of these kind of ath atheistic qualms that we hear of, uh, you know, why is God killing God to pay God? Uh, you know, that those are legitimate questions on the Western Latin theological paradigm, which is a big mess. Yeah, why, why is that happening? That doesn't make any sense, right? Um, anyway, and then, of course, worst of all is when the Protestants, the classical Reformed uh, and, and uh, Lutherans uh, adhere to their blasphemous doctrine that the father damned the son and that this is how the payment went down right so god had to take out his uh, eternal wrath and damnation on somebody uh, he didn't want to do it on man jesus took it for him and so the trinity was uh, split the the person of christ was split from the person of the father in damnation and the will of the trinity was split even though the trinity has one will in all orthodox theology and by the way once you learn this uh, everybody who learns that leaves Protestantism. Uh, they leave Calvinism because that's classic Calvinist, Puritanical, Lutheran teaching. And there's no way to be Trinitarian and hold that blasphemous view. Uh, I have articles that I wrote on that 10 years ago. You can find them at Jay's Analysis. Uh, very, very, very easy. Probably the easiest, clearest way to refute Calvinists and Lutherans. Uh, you are anti-Trinitarian blasphemers when you think the Father damned the Son. That's just ridiculous. It, but we, but when we mess up in Genesis, everything else messes up, unfortunately. So it's kind of a, you know it, it's a balanced paradigm here. The, the the theology balances here. You can't have Jesus without Adam. You can't have eschatology without anthropology. Your anthropology is going to be screwed up if it's not biblical anthropology. So out with the theistic evolution, out with the dichotomy of man and the Augustinian paradigm of body and intellect, out with that, get that out of here, out with the beatific vision, out with all that. No, man's noose is missing here. Man is a tripartite being with a body, a soul, and a noose. And the noose is the faculty by which he directly perceives God. And the only way to directly perceive God is not through intellect. Now, the intellect should see God in all things. But the problem is that the intellect has become attached to material sensation through the fall. And it's actually lost its ability to see what's truly at the heart of all things, which is the Logoi. Now that's really deep. We're not going to go into all that, but I'm just going to grab a drink of water and we're going to do a little more here in Genesis. And then uh, by the time we get to the Nephilim and the giants, which is a big part of this, Right, I think people 
don't grasp the Nephilim thing in Genesis 6 because they don't believe in the angelic realm. But if you believe in angels falling from every one of the nine choirs to be part of Satan's uh, army, right? There, It's not hard to, to see how Genesis 6 would be uh, read in that way, right? They left their proper abode and lusted after the daughters of men. That's what we're told in Jude. Daniel speaks of the watchers this way. So if we believe Daniel and Jude, uh, why is this so hard to believe, right? Well, it's just comes down to questions of a lack of faith. So I'm going to grab a glass of water and a little bit more coffee. I will be back in about probably one or two minutes. some water do a little bit of chat interaction here there are many prominent orthodox who do not agree with your positions gregorian uh so what there are prominent people in all ideologies that will disagree with other people so what um there are plenty of prominent Orthodox who do agree with my positions. And by the way, if you look at the history of the church, uh, there are always phases and periods where there's dispute, where there's debate, whether where there's people who are persecuted, cast out. I'm not saying I'd be persecuted. Oh, well, actually, I am at times persecuted, but uh, not to the degree you know of anybody like the martyrs or anything like that. But um, so what? I mean, every in the age of Arianism, there were, you know, not a whole lot of bishops in the empire who weren't Arian or semi-Arian or weak and watered down on the issue. And who was right? Athanasius and the Orthodox and all the anti-Arians were right. So the fact that so-called prominent Orthodox people don't agree with me means absolutely nothing. So what? Like, I don't know that. <laughs> I mean, orthodoxy right now is kind of having a split right down the middle with the question of ecumenism. So thank you for telling me the obvious. Any, any more obvious, Gregorian, that you want to let me in on? Orthodox have a massive scope of differing beliefs. American Orthodox will differ. Actually, that's not true. I mean, it depends on what you mean. Uh, you know, one of the benefits of orthodoxy is that there is more wiggle room and we don't have Talmudic uh, Alphonsus Liguori is trying to damn us uh, because of a divorce. Uh, the ancient code of St. Basil allowed for divorce and remarriage, which Roman Catholics never talk about. Um, uh, when it comes to the theology of specific areas, uh, there might be divergence on something like eschatology, but so what? There's divergence in Roman Catholics about eschatology. There's divergence, you're, you're saying, between Americans and Russians uh, on what? On the basics of, like, the Nicene Creed? Not really. Uh, if you mean the influence of leftist liberals foundations and the CIA on Ameridox. Absolutely. Yeah, there's divergence there. But so what? That's uh, you're, you're never going to find a group that doesn't have that same criticism. There's divergence amongst the atheists. There's divergence amongst the Roman Catholics. I spent 10 years amongst them. And anybody who acts like there's not divergence amongst Roman Catholics is just lying to themselves. I mean, I can go down my street and then to Nashville and to Memphis and I can find 
probably 30 different Roman Catholic parishes that will all have different ideas. I can go to the FSSP. I can go to the group that follows Father Gruner and only talks about Fatima all day. I can go to the SSPX and we can only talk about Bishop Williamson all day and nonsense about all that garbage. I can go down to the conservative Novus Ordo and we can talk about how the SSPX are wrong and uh, Pope Francis is a liberal. Then I can go to the remnant group and they're going to talk about how Francis is now a heretic. Yes, the remnant guys are saying Francis is a heretic. So, so if you're under the delusion that the Roman Catholic world is somehow immune to this, give me a freaking break. Any honest Roman Catholic knows that that is not true. <laughs> give me a break. Oh, I forgot the state of Acontis too. I can I can uh, drive five hours to East Tennessee to find. Yes, there is a set of a conscious priest. I can go find him if I'm, if I'm up for driving five hours, and he'll tell me all the other groups are wrong. So don't play this lame disagreement card. That's one of the weakest cards ever. Uh, anyway, this is not... Do I think the church fathers were white? Are you talking about me? Come on, dude. That's not what this is. This is not a place where... Dude, I spent 14 years in the Church Fathers. Uh, whoever thought that they were all white? Come on. I just need to start banning some of these dudes because they're going to just degenerate my chat. Dastardly Muffins. Are you saying that you think I believe the Church Fathers are all white? <laughs> no, Augustine was not was not white. Did you know? Did you know Augustine was not white? Do you know what Numidians are? This chat is just preposterous. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dastardly. There's a dude in the chat that thinks. What do we have? Like one of these uh, Christian identity goofballs in here or something? Who speaks Aramaic? There actually actually are there a few groups that speak Aramaic, by the way. In uh, yeah, so why are we talking about that though? Um, we're here to talk Genesis. We're not going to talk about that stuff. Arguments amongst yeah, just ignore the goofballs. So when man is banished, he leaves, and you have the attempts at setting up human society. And these, of course, are disastrous because of the fall. But God, even here, interjects his mercy in the midst of chastisement. And I think the most important thing that we want to stress about the Cain and Abel story is that they're kind of represented. The, the, I, they are historical people, but in terms of typology, they represent two approaches to religion. And it's not obviously that, as the fathers say, uh, Cain's sacrifice of grain was inherently evil. There's nothing inherently evil about grain. God later accepts grain. The Eucharist is a form of right uh, of grain offering to God. Um, it's that his heart was wrong. And in fact, the text even says that, right? Our, when he says, why am I my brother's keeper? Right? He's now echoing the fall in the sense that Adam was a murderer by murdering his descendants through his decision, introducing death. God even forgave Adam the murderer. This is orthodox, by the way, that the harrowing of hell, by the way, the icon includes Christ's descent to hell to save Adam and Eve. Did you know Adam and Eve are saved? You think Latin theology would talk about that? No, I'm sure there's some Latin theologian that does somewhere, but I'm just saying you don't usually hear that in uh, Roman Catholic theology. But um, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain. And says, I have acquired a man through God. Now, presumably, they could have had other kids. We just aren't told. So uh, the the relationship between brother and sister and where they got their wives, uh, just like the fact that you lived a lot longer, right? Methuselah lived very long. Noah lived very long. Adam lived very long. Excuse me. Uh, well, Adam did. Cain and Abel uh, presumably also lived for a very long time. Uh, there would be other people right, from presumably Adam and Eve. But these people are mentioned because they were central 
because they were um, theologically representative, as we said, of two types of people. One who thinks that they can do an exterior act and fool God by hating God on the inside and hating man on the inside. And by the way, when you hate your fellow man, you also hate God. And that's what God points out is that is that uh, when you say, why am I my brother's keeper? You've already committed murder in your heart. So what Jesus teaches about the law, right, where Jesus says, if you hate your brother in your heart, you've already committed murder. He's all he's doing is echoing this principle here in Genesis. So Jesus, once again, is not out of accord with Genesis. There wasn't a different dispensation or morality at work in Genesis. No, Jesus gave the morality and the law in Genesis because Jesus created man in his image. So it's Jesus talking to Abel, and, and to Cain and Abel. Now, it is true, as all the fathers teach that discuss this, that Abel, as the tender of sheep, as the, the sacrifice of... Uh, of his flock is a type of Christ absolutely and so he dies right uh, at his brother's hands uh, and his death is avenged by God and most of the church fathers think that this is a type of Jesus's death at the hand of his brothers the Jews just like Joseph is betrayed by his brothers right and sold into slavery and they attempt to kill him by throwing him down the well which is a type of Christ's descent and then re resurrection being uh, raised to right next to Pharaoh in power so likewise uh, Abel dying and his blood falling down on the earth and calling out for God's retribution and vengeance is a type of the death of Christ quite clearly the shepherd who dies an unrighteous death at the hands of his brethren now Cain's family is interesting because this is the origin of this uh, what Augustine would call the city of man right M mankind's civilization in rebellion against God and there's truth to that right I mean there's there's nothing wrong with saying yeah it's, it's the city of man it's 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 erected around the worship of man and by extension Satan in opposition to uh, the city of God or the New Jerusalem or the church, right? The true Israel, the spiritual the spiritual Israel is operant in this period too, by the way. So Abel represents the seed of the woman that we saw in Genesis 3. Cain represents the seed of the serpent. Now they're both from the same mother. So the seed of the serpent is not a literal genetic thing of some group of people. It's a spiritual reality of people who uh, hate God in their heart and everyone in rebellion as a son as a son of Adam <laughs> hates God they're in rebellion and there has to be a change of heart not only before you get right with God but guess what this is what most people don't know there has to be a change of heart before you can interpret the world right you see Genesis is revelation it's revealed truth and you can't interpret scripture you can't interpret the world correctly without your heart getting right first and now that's not in some fuzzy evangelical sense because when i say your heart getting right i'm not just talking about you crying and come down to the altar this is a billy graham crusader billy graham i've got pizza we've got pizza down here at the front of the altar if you come down and pray the sinner's prayer with me billy graham i'll give you a slice of pizza <laughs> right well, i'm not talking about some stupid evangelical thing i'm talking about a complete metanoia right the greek for repentance which means a complete about face where you reject the previous paradigm its morals its actions and you reorient your entire paradigm that's what it means and that's not just intellectual that's your heart and your intellect being reoriented right in which case the noose then begins to see and seek god So, Cain's descendants set up corrupt civilization. 
Now, this is very different from what we see in the naturalists, right? The scientific, quote unquote, historians, Jacques Attali, they picture man's origins and civilization as this one mutating blob over time, right? It's, it's the Babylonians and Gilgamesh, Mesopotamians and Egypt, and it's just blobs morphing. No, here we have the presentation of good and evil, right? You don't get good and evil in the other systems. You get maybe virtue and honor and versus, uh, you know, the God, the gods fighting, Man and Prometheus and these kinds of stories. You get you get that. You don't get good and evil. Here you get good and evil. But notice that evil, in the case of Cain, is not Gnostic. Evil is his will, his choice of hating his brother. It's an inner disposition of his heart to follow his corrupt passions. Evil is not his body. Evil is not exterior society. Evil is not the world. Evil is not the demiurge's creation. Evil is a moral act. And this is man's central problem. Man is morally bankrupt from the fall. Now, he doesn't always sin, right? We're not Calvinists, but I'm saying that his tendency is in that direction. And so God says, temptation is at the door of your heart to Cain, showing that Cain still had the operation of free will. He didn't lose all of his action, all of his uh, faculties uh, in terms of Calvinism. He wasn't totally depraved. Uh, no, he, he willfully chooses not only to hate his brother, but then to murder his brother. And God even still is merciful to him, puts a sign on him and banishes him uh, out of the church of this time. Right? The, the family of uh, Adam and Eve and Seth uh, and their children is the church at this time. That's where the covenant resides at this time. And Cain is excommunicated. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't ever do the death penalty because Cain's ex excommunicated. No, dummy pacifists. No, dummy liberals. You don't know anything about your Bibles. That's because the death penalty isn't given yet. The death penalty is given to Noah. So it has nothing to do with, like, this is what people do. Oh, well, can't, God didn't, uh, he put a mark on Cain, so therefore uh, the, God uh, believes in is, is a pacifist. No, he's not. I mean, you die because of the fall. God's not a pacifist. <laughs> I mean, read the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible about pacifism at all, ever. Not even in the New Testament, right? And no, Matthew 5 Beatitudes is not pacifism. Jesus says you can't, by the way, Leviticus itself says you can't hate your brother. You must love your brother from your heart. Genesis right here says you can't hate your brother in your heart. You must love him. Right. Uh, and it also says not to seek personal vengeance. Right. You seek retribution if necessary in the just way through, you know, courts and law. Right. Hopefully. Uh, Jesus is the one that set up the courts and the law right, in Leviticus. So Jesus is not saying that you have to be abused your whole life. Of course he's not. Jesus was not abused his whole life intentionally. He didn't just sit there and let people abuse him all day. No, at he did what was appropriate for the time. Sometimes he left. Sometimes he faced his enemies. Sometimes he took, carried a sword. Sometimes he overturned the money changers. And then sometimes he submitted to death when it was what was appropriate to do. All right. So, I mean, if the entire Roman Empire comes after you and you're a martyr, uh, is, it, is that the time to take up arms? Right. The, the, you're a second century guy and the entire Roman Empire comes against you and throws you to the lions. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, you're not going to fight them. <laughs> no, you might as well be a martyr. Right. There's no point even in fighting. Uh, but that does not mean that you must always and never defend yourself. That's preposterous. Now, why do people come up with these stupid ideas? Well, because for one, they don't actually know what's in the Bible. They don't actually know that Exodus teaches self-defense. They don't actually know the New Testament teaches self-defense. They're misinformed. So this evil civilization begins the project of setting up a corrupt imperium the world imperium babylon which it's about to be babylon 
is being set up here. All right, so we're only in Genesis 4, but it's about to turn into Babylon, right? Uh, and so Cain and, and, and his wife bore Enoch. This is not the good Enoch. What's interesting is that the, the several of the names uh, of the line of Seth and the line of Cain are similar. So it's almost like there's a, a kind of mimicking going on here. Like Satan's kingdom is sort of mimicking the kingdom of God at this time. So there's a good Enoch and a bad Enoch. Uh, and then Lamech uh, begins the uh, principle of polygamy. Right? Lamech takes more than one wife. This is an, a new innovation. Uh, I'm sure he found out the hard way that that probably wasn't a good idea. Uh, and what's weird, though, is that the fallen line begins to do things like music. This is where we get Psalter and Harp. They engage in scientific process and technique for livestock. They engage in metallurgy, right? Verse 22. Tubal Cain is a smith and a manufacturer of bronze and iron. Now, isn't that interesting because Tubal Cain, uh, the, the Masons think this is a really hilarious joke because two balls and a cane is you know, male sex organs to them. And they think that they that Tubal Cain was the first Mason. I mean, this is the lineage of the seed of the serpent. And how dumb do you have to be as a Mason to think that you're honoring your forefathers uh, and, and the craftsmen, right? These are the first. I don't actually believe, by the way, that masonry descends from Tubal Cain. It's just a fraud that they say they do, right? They think they're connected to Hiram Abiff, and no, Hiram Abiff is not connected to modern Freemasonry. That's it's a bunch of made up baloney. But uh, Lamech, see, decides I'm going to avenge myself. And murder has entered here, see. And so this whole society it just starts going crazy. Uh, and they do have some advances and some inventions. And, you know, what's interesting is that the book of Enoch, which is cited by Jude, I'm not going to say that that necessarily means the book of Enoch is true, but it does appear to contain true tradition. Uh, the book of Enoch very clearly states that the fallen angels who are the watchers that Daniel mentions were at this time in this, this weird sort of not too long after the fall period, helping man set up fallen civilization, corrupt civilization. So if the book of Enoch is true, this is how man set this up. This is the origin of the worship of the gods. It's not only the worship of the origin of the gods, it's also the origin of human sacrifice. And it's not only the origin of human sacrifice, it's also the origin of cannibalism, bestiality, and... The mixing of things that shouldn't be mixed, put that way. In other words, you know, trying to breed man and animal. Now, I'm not saying that that necessarily actually happened. I, you know, we don't really know. But we are told that these spirits who did want to interbreed with man, uh, the daughters of men, these spirits also promoted the most disgusting things like bestiality, like like everything you would think is demonic, right? Uh, it begins here. This is where it begins. It begins in Genesis 4 with the city of man, the city of Satan, we'll just call it, Cain's family, the Cainites. And no, I don't mean that in the, the Gnostic sense. So then we have, a, that's contrasted with the descendants of Adam. And the descendants of Adam in chapter 5 uh, are those who still retain the tradition of worshiping the true God, right? The descendants of, of Cain, uh, it, this degenerates into idolatry. But even the descendants of Cain, interestingly, uh, it's, they're not totally corrupt at this point. They're not, they're not God still says uh, that anyone that kills Cain um, shall be, what does he say? 
shall be aven- if anyone hurts Cain, he will God will uh, avenge Cain sevenfold. So it's still not, you still can't commit murder. Right? There's still no death penalty. It's still, um, it's still wrong. But what we have in the, the, what's contrasted with that group who doesn't call upon God is that Adam and Eve, uh, after they had Seth and Seth is killed, they have another son, Enosh. And it says, Enosh hoped in the Lord and called upon the name of God. So the wicked obviously don't call them the name of God. We do. Um, and that's, this is the beginning of the contrast of these two cities, these two groups, these two, or the city of God, the city of heavenly Jerusalem, and Babylon. Babel, right? And so from the beginning of Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament, all the way through church history up till now, that is the same present reality that we exist in. So it's not some place. It's not like, oh, I'm going to go to Rome and there, therefore I'm in Babylon. It's not a location. It's a spiritual reality. The church, which is not in one location, is the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem on earth. And the city of man, <laughs> which is not necessarily New York because the church of God is in New York, the church of God is in Moscow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's a spiritual reality of those in rebellion against God. Um, but this is where we come to the interesting question of Genesis 6. And, the, and I'm going to skip over the genealogy, not because the genealogies aren't, aren't important, but I mean, it's not going to be that pertinent to this talk, which is about the battle of good and evil, the spiritual warfare of good and evil that has existed since this time continues into today and it does touch on this question of the giants now let's read the text in Genesis 6 after uh, these two civilizations flourish begin to grow obviously the, the wicked are probably much more numerous at this point now it came to pass that when men began to exist in great numbers on the earth that daughters were born to them and when the sons of God right and the word here is angels, saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, they took wives for themselves, any that they chose. And then God said, My spirit will not rest wrestle with flesh for forever. Wait a minute. My spirit will not remain with these people forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be numbered 120. So God has limited the lifespan. Now there were giants on the earth in that day, and then afterwards, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, right? And they bore children. These were the mighty men of old, the men of renown. So the idea here is that Nimrod, Hercules, right? They were just humans, but they may have been humans of uh, a, a bad lineage, <laughs> a lineage that was not meant to be. All right, so let's look at what Jude says when he talks about this event. And he does cite the book of Enoch. Jude says, I want to remind you in Jude 5 that once you knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those that didn't believe. And remember the angels that did not keep their proper domain, but they left their abode. Them he has reserved in everlasting chains in darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, having given themselves over to immorality and gone after weird flesh, strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So according to Jude, the abnormality of what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah is likened to the ab abnormality of the angels that did not keep their proper domain. And then Jude goes on to cite the book of Enoch, right? And of course we have Peter saying much the same thing. The, the spirits that sinned in the days of Noah God has reserved in chains in Hades. So 
these spirits committed a very, very heinous sin. And what would that be? Well, it's not just rebellion against God, uh, because all of the fallen angels did that. This is a specific group that did this. Right, so let's look at one of many forgotten texts. Forgotten forgotten lore. You want some forgotten lore? It's right here, buddy. Who else has touched on this? We're going to look at Judith. And if we turn to Judith 16, this is fascinating. And again, I want to stress that what I'm talking about, I'm not going to give you the uh, sort of ev goofy evangelical thing where George Norrie saw Steve Quayle opening up a Stargate with Nephilim and MacGyver walking through the Stargate. We're not going to go there. We're going to go... <laughs> to things that those people don't know anything about. I guarantee you they've never read Judith. I can tell you that for sure. I guarantee you most Catholics haven't read Judith. But what does Judith say? Here at Judith 16. <clears throat> And this is a, a song. This is the song of Judith. Um, and it's talking about playing hymns to God. And then it goes, to, goes on to say, The Lord Almighty has thwarted them, the enemies of God, uh, by the hand of a woman. He's talking about the times that God used a woman to be victorious. Their mighty men did not fall by our young men, nor did the titans strike God down, nor did all the giants attack him. Judith, the daughter of Merari, beauty, beautiful in her appearance, disabled the enemies of God. According to Judith, the Titans and the Giants are real. Now, I'm not, they weren't real in t Judith's day. She wasn't fighting. She's talking about ancient history, is what I'm saying. So, uh, you know, we could say, well, the, you know, I just don't accept the Deuterocanon. Well, you can do that, but, uh, you know, our church does accept the Deuterocanon. So, you know, whatever. Uh, now, this is interesting, too, because, and by the way, these are not just from the Deuterocanonical text. I'm just saying the Deuterocanonical text of the Orthodox Bible, they shed more light on this, and it's fascinating. The letter of Barak, right? So if you look in the Orthodox Study Bible, another one of the Deuterocanonical texts is Barak. And Barak says... O Israel, how great is the house of God. This is Barak 3. How far reaching is his, how far reaching the place he possesses. Uh, it is great, it has no end. It is high and immeasurable. The giants that were born there, those renowned from the beginning, very large in size and skilled in war. God did not choose the giants nor grant them the, the way of knowledge. Instead, they perish because they fail to attain to the wisdom, to, to the wisdom of God, and they perish through their own thoughtless counsel. That is exactly the way Jude and Enoch describes the fall of the giants. And even the Orthodox Study Bible, in the notes on Barak, <laughs> oh, even the Orthodox Study Bible here admits it's talking about giants. That is what it's talking about. So we're once again confronted with, what are we going to do? Are we going to admit what the Bible says? Or are we going to concoct some baloney about, I don't know what. Uh, one, well, one or two more texts that do shed light on this. that uh, The forgotten lore. What other stream is going to give you forgotten lore on Genesis and the Giants? from the Deuterocanon. And people get so mad. They're so mad at this channel. So mad. What are you so mad about? We're talking about giants. How could that, how could that not be fun? Wisdom. Deuterocanonical book of wisdom. 
Wisdom 16. In the congregation of sinners, a fire will be kindled. Uh, and in a disobedient nation, wrath will be kindled. There was no atonement for the ancient giants who turned away from God because of their strength. So the giants, again, are the source of idolatry and possibly the source of other things. Because if you heard my other talks, what did we examine with the Canaanite conquest? Guess what? They're all giants, aren't they? So the flood does not end this practice uh, of whatever exactly is going on here. right? And, and the very fact that after the flood... We have the admonition to clean out the promised land of this human sacrifice, bestiality, something else kind of cult, angel cult, demon cult, that shows you that it didn't just end with the flood. It continued on. Now, there's more verses, and we're going to look at a few of those uh, as we move into Genesis 6. And I'm also going to give some of my, my statements on how I think this might be possible. In other words we do nowadays see genetic modification, right? So it's not with outside of the realm of human of, of the human domain, of the created domain, that things can be gem gem genetically modified and mutated to breed bizarre things. Uh, it's very possible. So could the watchers of ancient times, who are the origins of all universal idolatry right and the worship of the gods and the occult practices could they have had access to knowledge of how to manipulate human dna i'm not saying Gen zechariah such and crap i'm just saying that it is possible to mutate people we know that now dna can be manipulated and so therefore it's entirely possible that there was some crazy stuff going on we just don't know Right. So thank you. I will read some of the super chats. This was the first talk for free. If you want to hear the rest of the talk as we delve into more of Genesis, more of the Book of Enoch, my thoughts on the Book of Enoch. I'm not saying the Book of Enoch is, quote, canon. I'm just saying that it does, according to Jude, contain some true tradition. So we're going to analyze Enoch. Uh, we're going to analyze some more New Testament texts that refer to the giants and what we're talking about. Peter and Hades, Tartarus, did you know Peter talks about Tartarus? Did you know that Jesus went to Hades and Tartarus and preached the gospel? Did you know that? Yes. So we're going to look at all those texts. Uh, we're going to look at how this actually is relevant to theology and the death, burial, uh, ascent, death, burial, descent, and ascent uh, of Christ. Uh, how it is possible that modern day so-called science is discovering crazy insane level discoveries f because of secret tech this is just a, an opinion a theory is the secret tech in some way related to ancient hermetic esoteric knowledge that originated with fallen nephilim is that possible we're going to explore that theory Explore that in hour two uh, by subscribing at Jay's Analysis. So, no, not tartar sauce. Tartarus, the Greek underworld, if you're familiar with Greek mythology. Tartarus, not tartar sauce. So we have a few super chats. And now is the time, by the way, if you want to send super chats, I'll read them. I'm not going to scroll back through all this uh, um, through all this stuff tonight. Yes. This is, I do give you the traditional reading of Genesis. Uh, and I do believe Genesis 6 is talking about giants. And again, I we just showed you a whole bunch of really neat texts. There's more, by the way. There are more texts uh, in the Orthodox Deuterocanon that will talk about giants. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, again, now is the time for Super Chats. So let's start with Physicist Group. This is Enlightened by Apple. Physicist group debunked BB theory. Big Bang, Big Bang theory. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't be surprised. I don't. I'm not familiar with what physicist group 
you're talking about, uh, but I've always thought big, the Big Bang Theory is preposterous. Uh, it's just a materialist version of creation, just like multiverse is a materialist version of atheistic mysticism. Gabriel R., what do you make of the archaeological... Where'd it go? What do you make of the archaeological claims which state that the story of Noah predates biblical times and has been recycled in the scriptures? Uh, is, are you talking about Graham Hancock? I think Graham Hancock has some theory about that. Again, if you heard the first part of the talk, Gabriel, what I said was that we are entirely justified in being skeptical of anything that starts to move past 3,000 years ago. We don't know the dating of the book of Job. Okay, Most people think the book of Job is, along with the Torah, the oldest books in the Bible. But we have no idea when, when Job was written. Nobody knows. It's all speculation. So, um, if you're talking about Graham Hancock claiming which he does, I think, in his Fingerprints of the God book. Cause, I mean, I read that like 10 years ago. If I remember, he says uh, there's all kinds of Noah stories and uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. He, you know, he does this redating thing of how the Epic of Gilgamesh and all these these things are way off or something. I don't really listen to Graham, to Graham Hancock's talk, but uh, I do think some of it's interesting. That you know, there does so the Piri Reyes map stuff is interesting, and but I don't really go into the Graham Hancock stuff anymore. But um, if that's what you're talking about, no, because it's all just speculation anyway. So the Bibli when it comes to ancient stuff, they're no way no better off than we are. They don't have any greater mystical tools than we have. I mean, all they have is the assumptions of radiometric dating, which is a method all based on the presupposition of the dates of radioactive decay already being correct, which has not been questioned in their presupposition. Uh, so that's all they have. And when you try to reconstruct ancient civilizations, all you've got is guesswork in terms of archaeology and paleontology. And all you've got is historical records. And we know what those are. So unless there's a secret society that has secret historical records, uh, which some conspiracy theorists claim, but there's no evidence for this right, beyond a conspiracy theory claim, uh, all they have is the same records we have. The writings of the church fathers, the ancient liturgies, the New Testament, the writings of the Greeks, the writings of Plato. But guess what? The writings of Plato are only as old as the Middle Ages, B A.D. Did you know that? Did you know the oldest Plato is from the Middle Ages? So does that mean that all re and that doesn't mean, oh, so Plato was invented in the Middle Ages? No, I'm not saying that. There's church fathers writing in the second, third centuries that talk about Plato. That's completely stupid. Uh, some people do say that, by the way. But uh, but no, so I, I would not buy a completely speculative theory of, oh, the Epic of Gilgamesh mentions a flood, and therefore it's it's ancient. It's 10,000 years old, so therefore Noah is a... Re no, it's not. You have no way of knowing the Epic of Gilgamesh is 10,000 years old. I'm not saying you, Gabriel. I'm just speaking to these people. Uh, anyway. Super Striker says 10 bucks. Thank you, Super Striker. Tyler said, did I skip one? Oh, my, sorry, my scroll went too fast here. Okay, uh, Gabriel is on the Toll Houses. Okay, I, <clears throat> I've i read several books on Toll Houses. I've not read the giant book that uh, the, the monastery that has put out on the Toll Houses. So I'm waiting to comment on that until I've read that and that book's like 60 bucks and really long I just haven't had time to get to this yet uh, but I have read several books on that are already out on on the toll houses uh, yeah obviously I've read Father Rose's book uh, I've read Greek uh, critiques of the toll house view uh, this is a very difficult thing I it's not worth it does deserve to be discussed but you know eventually this is going to be worked out I wouldn't worry about it too much uh, I look, I've looked at the arguments on both sides. There is some kind of something going on after death. Okay, there is some kind of uh, 
not the final judgment, but some kind of uh, accounting and reckoning. It does involve the angels. Um, toll houses is, is a little, yes, I know I know what the terms in, in the saints and liturgy can be at times. Um, so I, I'm sensitive to both sides of this topic because I understand that we don't want to adopt a view where the soul has to do this Gnostic ascent through the spiritual planes back to the one. And sometimes it's it's spoken of in that way. So that's part of the problem, and that is a valid criticism. But many fathers do say that there is a kind of... Uh, pur purgation is not a, a wise word to use, but a reckoning and a kind of chastisement or fixing that goes on after death. And this is why we pray for the dead. We pray that the sins of the dead will be forgiven. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, we don't want to interject a new version of purgatory where you're having to uh, be tortured through some kind of angel thing to pay for uh, this infinite debt that you owe God. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to dismiss the many statements that are there that do talk about something going on after death. So I think this is a lot of mystery. I don't really have an answer to exactly what goes on after death, um, and I'm going to refrain until I read the giant 500-page book from the monastery uh, that is supposedly the, you know, the magnum opus on this question. So, until I've read that book, I can't really give you my opinion. And by the way, as you get older, you realize that uh, my salvation is not going to be dependent on uh, my Amazon wish list uh, because God is not a Talmudic bean counter. Uh, and he's not a giant egghead who, who you're not saved by your IQ. Uh, this is a temptation, though, for many of us who do focus on intellect. We do get distracted into thinking that we're saved when we can get our infinite doctrinal books mastered. And guess what? You're not saved by that. So I don't think it's a, at this point, salvific issue. People are getting heated over it, mainly ascetics and monks and bishops. Uh, so I'm not worried about it. It'll all get settled, and I'll have to to read uh, read more on it, pray on it too. By the way, I've also learned after 20 years of this that God actually will bring you the answer to questions at the right time, and I've experienced that so many times that I don't really worry with it anymore. I don't. Um, when it's the right time to know the answer to that question. I will have the answer. Thank you, Super Striker, for 10 bucks. Chris says, excuse me, Tyler says, what is the Orthodox Church position on self-defense and gun ownership? I've debated many liberals over gun control, and they think that Jesus wasn't for self-defense. Yeah, see, this is what I've touched on in a few talks recently, and um, the Orthodox position should be classical and traditional. Now, if you're in America, you're going to meet a lot of Ameridox or people who have been liberalized who basically are American first and then Orthodox second, right? And that's that's because that's the doctrine of America itself. Americanism is have your religion in your private sphere as long as you accept the Masonic syncretism of everything in the public sphere. And that's why it's everyone who attempts to bring their religion into public life gets harassed and persecuted and destroyed in the media except for certain religious views so uh so if you're talking about the unfortunate situation of foundations think tanks wealthy elites and oligarchs and the cia trying to influence the orthodox church yes you will unfortunately encounter quote orthodox liberals but they're not orthodox so everybody knows, we all know, that the history of the church, with this, this alone should solve it, has canonized saints who were kings and warriors, and therefore there's just war. So I have an essay, uh, uh, Pacifism and the Patriarchal Death Penalty. I think it's, a, I always forget the title of that essay. But in that essay, I just cite even early church fathers on the death penalty and on just war. So, yes, 
Now, in terms of the New Testament, again, at times, and it's about, this is what wisdom, wisdom is the appropriate application of the law at the right time. Right? So you can't have some kind of super legalistic, all or nothing position in life, because life isn't that way. And that's why Solomon says, do not be overly righteous, right? Solomon's writings are inspired, okay? Ecclesiastes is inspired. Uh, that's why Solomon knew that in the case of the whores that were fighting over the baby, that when he said, okay, let's rip the baby in two, that the real mother would give way and say, okay, she can have it. And that's how he knew that the real mother was the woman who was willing to give up her child so that the child could live. And Solomon has been forever praised because that was a super wise application of the law. Nowhere in the law does it say to do that. But Solomon had wisdom, so he knew how to apply the law. And this is what you learn as you get older. I'm not saying I have mastered wisdom, far be it from me to ever, I'm still a goofball. But I have learned that as you get older, life isn't black and white. And so what is required is wise application of the law. And that's what happens in the history of the church. And that's what Jesus does in the New Testament. Jesus at times overturns the money changers table. <gasps> An act of violence. Jesus at times hands his disciples a sword. Self-defense. Jesus at times says, now is the time when I go to my death. Sorry. So it depends on what's appropriate at the time. And this is what does Solomon say in Ecclesiastes? There's a time for war, a time for peace. A time for every purpose under heaven to everything. <laughs> that was kind of smart of them to base their song on Ecclesiastes. Because now anybody that hears Ecclesiastes, like one of the fam most famous wisdom texts of all history, is going to think of that goofy song, right? So um, the traditional Orthodox position is that there is the death penalty, that there's just war, and you have absolutely every right to self-defense. And this shouldn't even be debated. And that's all there is to it. The Bible teaches all these principles. And I will challenge any Orthodox so-called person who wants to come on here and debate me on these topics, they will lose. I guarantee you that I will annihilate them on these topics. From the church fathers, from church history and tradition, from Serbian kings who fought sheiks, right? who fought Turks. All you got to do is say, hey, haven't there been Serbian saints that fought Muslims? Oh, that was history. We live in a different world today. We live in a different world today. Have you looked at uh, Europe? <laughs> Uh, minarets everywhere we live in a different world what are you talking about you live in a different world right because you're not actually orthodox at all so does orthodoxy have an alternative to catholic distributism and corporatism big gay capitalism seems anti anti antithetical to living right yeah, absolutely right i mean how many times have i talked about uh globo homo capitalism often there, there's not, well, the actually what's interesting is that there's not like a, um, orthodoxy is different in that there's not a, 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 a document uh, like that you go to that is the, the, the secular teaching of the church for secular theory because there is no secular realm. There is no secular realm. This is interesting. You see, the recapitulation of Christ the doctrine of the Logoi, the traditional doctrine of the Orthodox Imperium and monarchy, means there's no secular realm. The idea of a secular realm is the idea of Voltaire and the Enlightenment and Americanism. America is the great secular experiment. So, there's not a, a worked out philosophy of like how like rerum navarum or something like that because the orthodox position is scripture scripture and the teaching of the church is already there on how to behave on how there should be government how there should be 
an erection of society. Now, yes, many of the distributist principles are true, uh, but they're, they're true not because of some gigantic tome from a Catholic philosopher. They're true because they reflect the principles of Orthodox theology. <laughs> That's why they're true. Uh, so in other words, all you need is revealed scripture and the church and the liturgy and everything flowing out of this would correct society. So we're not going to worry. I mean, I agree with you absolutely, Muffins, that those are real problems that need to be fixed. But for us, until the heart problem in man and a revival of Orthodox theology happens, which is actually happening in, in many parts of the world, by the way, until that happens, the rest of this stuff isn't going to get fixed. Then when man starts to live out his life liturgically, the rest of this stuff would get fixed. So liturgy is the solution to distributism and corporatism. Because once the liturgy is inculcated into the culture, integrated into the culture, people are living it out, the, the rhythm of the liturgy, their lives will be conformed. They will gradually conform to it. The society will gradually conform to it. This is what happened in the history of the church. This is how the church Christianized the Roman Empire, and you had Byzantium, the longest lasting empire in the history of the world. It's It was because of the liturgy. That's why. And that's the key here. Uh, so that is what will Christianize people. That's what will save society. That was what will save the West. The liturgy will. I'm not saying magical powers of just putting some vestments and smoke and mirror. No, I'm talking about the whole package deal, obviously. Right? I'm using liturgy to stand in for the totality of Orthodox theology. Um, that's what would save things. So we got to get away from these bad ideas of God. Uh, God as the great uh, Talmudic bean counter. No wonder the West fell into all this stuff. And by the way, Hoffman has shown in his new book that it's not just Jews. <laughs> uh, we're so we talk about usury. Oh, guess what? What do you, who do you think promoted usury in the last seven hundred years more than Jews? Can you guess? Rome, the Vatican. Yes, controversial statement. And I would, if you doubt me, read Occult Renaissance Church of Rome. Hoffman demonstrates it. And by the way, that's something I've been saying for a while. Uh, and Hoffman also makes the connection to Hermeticism uh, and the introduction of usury and the Renaissance Rome, all connected. We've been saying that for a long time. Uh, James Kelly says that in his book. Um, anyway, so I wish there was an easy answer to the social sphere. Uh, but for us, the social sphere, the, the, all the church fathers teach on the, the social sphere. And the answer is to follow biblical law, the divine law, and to tithe <laughs> and to uh, practice what the church practiced for the first millennium, which was to not allow usury, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, because you can get into questions of what exactly is credit. You, you know, I'm not going to go into that debate, but roughly speaking, so society-wide, we shouldn't have these uh, giant viperous banks. That's a big part of it. Uh, so all we got to do is go back to the, the basic teachings here. And there's not any perfect philosophy that you're going to set up as like, you know, how to you know, navigate all this that's going to... I mean, yeah, m much of what's in distributism is true because the traditional orthodox position is not Adam Smith. It is not libertarianism. It's not any of that crap. It's not corporatism. All right. The traditional orthodox position is more social. It's monarchical and hierarchical. And that's what we should shoot for. And that's what it's all going to fall back into anyway. When all this New World Order stuff collapses, uh, I mean, who... Do the who do the the social justice warriors think? Do they think they're going to have like a kingdom? No, they're going to be smashing a day. <laughs> I mean, so uh, you know, when all this falls apart, it's going to be hierarchical anyway. So, so we have to we we have to re-Christianize is what we're doing. Right? The the whole West has fallen into paganism. We got to re-Christianize it. Rome has collapsed. Uh, a third there will not be. Probably Russia. Uh, I understand Russia's 
I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm not confident that they're necessarily going to save America or anything goofy like that. But uh, many have predicted, and not even saints, but even wise philosophers have wondered, will Russia save the West? Right. Spangler, students of Spangler, will Russia save the West? We will see. But, yeah, so that's where we are. And by the way, don't say that I'm saying we got to support all monarchs. No, come on. We're more sophisticated than that here. Uh, many of today's degenerate monarchs are CIA puppets. CIA has been buying off monarchs for 50 years. I'm not saying monarchy is going to save anybody. No. Uh, the last thing that you want to do is to try to do some top-down CIA monarch enforcing something. That would be a nightmare. What we want to do is keep what doing what we're doing, uh, keep expanding the church, keep converting people, and we've already been told we're going to win. We've already been told that the world will be made orthodox. Did you know that? Did you know the prophets predict not just some small smattering of orthodox nations here and there, but that the entire world will be converted to orthodox? You said that's crazy, Jay. That's crazy. How is that? That's not possible. Well, how do you think uh, Daniel or Jeremiah would have thought it was possible that the whole world would worship the God of Israel? How do you think it? Do you think that? I think even John, I, even the apostles would have found it hard to believe that the entire Roman Imperium would be converted to Orthodox Christianity within three or four centuries, and yet it was. So don't believe. Don't. What do, the, what do the angels say? Why do you doubt? With God, anything is possible. <laughs> I mean, God spoke the world into existence, right? He can bring about the Christianization, the orthodoxy of the globe. So don't be doubting, but believe. Thank you, guys. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, I think we hit all the super chats here. Uh, Corey says Jesus was pro-gun. Psalm AR-15. Yeah, okay, maybe. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go into the uh, more of the Giants, more of the Genesis six. My analysis, my position on that, very speculative. It's not dogmatic. You don't have to agree with me on the Giants to be orthodox. Uh, I'm just telling you what I think is is uh, biblically true. Uh, you can debate that or do it that way you want. That'll be in part two. Thank you guys for listening. Um, I have made progress in Jacques Attali again. I had to put that down for. Uh, a lot of other work I was doing. Uh, so, I don't know. I can't say exactly when we'll do the next Globalist book. It's just one I can finish. I mean, it, I don't know what to tell you. If you haven't read Jacques Attali, I don't know what to tell you. Sit down sometime and try to read Jacques Attali, and then you'll see what it's like. <laughs> so, thank you guys. And uh, the part two will be up tomorrow. I've already talked for... Two and a half hours. I don't think I can do part two tonight. It'll be up tomorrow for subscribers, and it will go out uh, to. It will be posted tomorrow night in the archives. So thank you all. Have a good night. God bless, and I will see you tomorrow.